G'day and welcome to the Farms of Ice podcast. Today on the show, we have John. John Sanderson, how are you going, mate? Good, mate. How are you? Really good. Bit wet over here currently, but fantastic to have you a part of the Harvest series that we have here on the Farms of Ice podcast for this year. First one off, and you're one of the many speakers or few speakers, but thanks for coming on to the series. Really good to be a part of it all and see what your operation looks like over there in Western Australia. Yeah, no dramas, mate. Happy to be a part of it. Beautiful, mate. Well, let's kick it off and see what your background is and your connection to agriculture. How did you get into it? Was it simple or a bit of a barrier? Nah, pretty simple for me. Um, my great-grandfather come over from England in the 20s. That's bad, isn't it? Podcast, right? My <laughs> phone turned on. I'll turn that off right now. Yeah, right. Um, um, yeah, great grandfather come over from England in the 20s and settled some new land just to the north of here. Um, he, yeah, walked off of that during the Great Depression, got a job for the State Farm back then, what would be the Department of Ag now. Um, then he walked onto a farm closer to Salmon Gums and um, after, the, uh, yeah, after the Depression, went away to war, come back and yeah, the my, my, my old man and my uncle and my auntie all grew up there on the family farm. I uh, ran into some hard times um, during the 70s with the wheat quotas and some other issues. So my grandfather sold the family farm and they all moved to Perth. And then uh, my grandfather and my uncle worked pretty hard to get back into farming again. And my old man, um, he went and got a trade as a diesel mechanic. And he came back down in the late 80s. My uncle and my grandfather had a farm just further north of us now. They will start to get there again, bush blocks. They'd started again from nothing. And yeah, the old man worked in with them for a few years and then managed to get an opportunity where I am, where I live here now, a grass patch. And yeah, as a bloke who's established here and his kids weren't interested, so he helped the old man into it in pretty good terms. So the old man went his own way from the family at that stage, um, moved down here the year I was born, 1990. So I've yeah, spent most of my life living right here. I, there's an old house just across about 100 metres away that we just pulled down. So yeah, right. that's where I spent my childhood. Beautiful. So a bit of a family affair. Interesting to hear that your family still, like they moved off from farming, but they were pretty keen to get straight back into it. How hard was that, do you think, selling up and then also later on getting back into it? Agriculture just yeah, brought you back? Yeah, pretty hard. Um, so I've got an aunt, uncle and an auntie, and obviously my uncle farms just north of us and my auntie still farms at Salmon Gums. So they all went off to Perth and they all come back within, we're all within 30, 40 k's of each other. But yeah, it was pretty hard. I think um, my grandfather went off to, to try something different and realised that, you know, this is where he wanted to be. So they, yeah, it was everyone come back down here. I think we've got a bit of a connection to the area. So yep. it was a really hard battle. It took a long time. All, all, all of us now, we're all separate businesses. Uh, all the three of, like my auntie, my uncle and my old man, Yep. But yeah, we're, we're, we're getting to a point now where we're starting to do things, you know, pretty good. We're pretty comfortable, but it's been a bloody long, hard road to get, get to where we are now. It's been some challenges, that's for sure. Yeah, absolutely. That comes with like everyone out there as the challenges, but great to see the rewards on the other side once you do come through and operation, operating pretty well on the other side. But great to see your connection to agriculture pretty deep rooted into your family and how it's come across over there in WA. Who's currently working on your operation now? Yeah, so it's me, me and the old man, um, my mum and my wife. So it's the four of us and we've got two full-time people working with us. Uh, Gav, he's been with us for about five or six years now. Uh, he's, he was a farmer himself uh, when he was younger and he's managed farms. He's been in industry his whole life. And we've got a trainee from the school farm in Esperance. He's just about to finish his Cert 3 in agriculture. So. Um, yeah, we've got a got a good little crew here, and we oh, you make use of some casuals sometimes, but we try yeah. and do the bulk of it in house with our full time staff. Yeah, beautiful. So those casuals are they over the harvest period once you're getting the crops off, or throughout the year? Yeah, so so we we used to use casuals for seeding and harvest uh, this year due to the lack of backpackers. We did it ourselves, and it was really good not having to try and train staff and language barriers and all that sort of stuff. So that was kind of one of the reasons of putting the trainee on. We figured I'd rather invest that time into getting another young person into the industry rather than just paying paying 
um, backpackers or casual workers. I do have a mate that works in the mining industry. He's going to come down and give us a hand at harvest time, driving the chaser bin on his roster weeks off. Yep. So that, again, fills that bit of a gap for us. But, yeah, it's all – casuals are purely seeding and harvest. During the year, it's just the, the four of us that, that keep the show ro- are rolling. Yeah, beautiful. And it's probably – it's bigger than the one-man show that a lot of farmers out there have. And it's great to see that you've brought a young person on and educating them around your – enterprise and shaping how they think about agriculture um, i'm sure they'll learn a lot in their in their role on farm is it more of a farmhand role or how do they see it yeah yeah definitely i'm a diesel mechanic by trade i went up to the gold fields uh, when i was 15 and got my trade and come back to the farm in my early 20s so i think it's um it, it you know i was a young bloke and got into ag I think it's important to, to keep them young people coming into ag. It was important to sort of get away and and um, get some other experiences. But yeah, th- this young bloke, we're bringing him in. It's, it's a farmhand role. Um, both our blokes are farmhand roles, but it's becoming more professional role now. Farmhands used to just be, you know, blokes that kicked around farming for a bit. I yeah. think a farmhand now essentially is a trade on its own. And I know the state government here in Western Australia are looking to make it into a trade to sort of try to attract them young people into the industry because we just lose them. The young people go off to the mining or to the cities and we, you know, we can't offer the, the lifestyle of the city or the money of the mines, but it's a whole new lifestyle down here that, you know, has a romance all of its own that we can, we can offer people. Yeah, definitely. I think the role has changed. I, I did my cert three of agriculture in my gap year before uni. Um, and yeah, I think it would work quite well if you are to be able to turn it into a trade and actually make that more accessible and tick a box for those young people coming through, which would be really good. And moving on, your crop program, what's it look like on farm for you guys? What do you have in for 2021 season? Yeah, so we crop 6,000 hectares. Um, there's about 4,800, 4,900 is ours, and we share yep. farm 1,100 hectares. So we crop, our main crop's wheat, we have two and a half thousand hectares of wheat in um, and barley, um, not, not as much barley as, as wheat. And yeah, break crop wise, we run canola this year, like everyone else in the country, probably a bigger canola yeah. program than usual with the price. But we're pretty heavily focused on legumes. So we've grown a lot of field peas in the past. Um, we've grown faba beans. We just started that last year. We're trialing some chick peas at the moment. Uh, we brown manure field peas, so if we've got a really, we just bought a farm last year of barley and it was pretty dirty, so we brown manure field peas there, so we can get a really good hit with a, with a couple of different chemistry groups on the on the, any resistant weeds, and then also we're pumping all that nitrogen back in for next year. Yeah, beautiful. So talking about the canola prices, they're through the roof currently, and you probably got a bit more in than you usually do. How do you make your decisions based around what sort of crops you should put in? Is it directly based around what you're going to get off it, the money at the time, or what's best for your soils? How do you work this out? Yeah, we we, we very, very rarely will put a crop in based on what the price is. So yeah. we go on summer rainfall and, and we try to stick to a pretty strict rotation. So we've got a certain amount of break crop that's going to go in regardless. So we haven't pulled any cereal production back for canola this year because it's pretty important we get that break for rye, rye grass control. So... This year we pulled some field pea area back because we never make money out of field peas. And, and then we pushed that canola program a bit more. Also the wet, see we come off a, not a bad summer. We've, we've just come out of three years, or we were coming out of three years of drought, but we, it's been an extremely wet start to the season, but it's been a dry finish. So we could finish this year in drought seasons again, but we had a couple of big rainfall events in early April, which, which give us confidence to put the canola in. Yeah, we put canola in the past in early April. It hasn't germinated until mid to late May, and there's just no point. It's not going to grow anything. So unless we have summer moisture or we're confident of getting a good rainfall event, we're normally pretty conservative on the canola. But we had uh, an inch of rain at the start of April and another inch of rain in the first week of May, and canola prices as they were, it was a pretty pretty easy decision to to push them them hectares up. Yeah, I suppose it's a like a bit more around risk management of your harvest program your cropping program when you sow are you looking at dry sowing you just get in there and get it done relying on that that april may sort of rain or do you wait for a rain event to come up and then 
get busy. We always used to wait for a rain event. Uh, since we've we've expanded a fair bit since 2013. So before 2013, we were cropping about, I'll probably switch around between hectares and acres a bit. We're about 5,000, 5,500 acres of crops, so a couple of thousand hectares. And then to now 6,000 hectares. So, well, and we're using a pretty similar size plant. You know, we've gone from a 50 foot bar to a 60 foot bar, but that's about it. So now we'll start seeding the first week of April regardless. Um, we'll put baby beans in because we can put them in deep into moisture and we're pretty confident they will germinate. Um, if there's some canola coming, we'll, uh, sorry, some rain coming, we'll drill the canola in regardless. And the brown manure and field peas will go in regardless. And then we'll probably got about a thousand hectares of wheat that'll go in regardless. So we can put pretty safely a third of our program in dry before we will start to stop and think, all right, let's pull up and wait for some rain. Um, but yeah, it, it used to be weather related, and now we've just got to we've just got to start seeding the first week of April. Or we won't get yep. programming. Yeah. Okay. So the way you think about that is like, if it doesn't rain, you still got a little bit in, so you can get something off. Or if if it no, if it does rain, you can get something off. But if it doesn't, um, you haven't put too much at risk there by planting the whole all your crops for that year is that right yeah that's right and that's sort of why we're looking for chickpeas or something that we can put in later so we we you know some people will go in and, and put a canola in and then come out and spray it out and put something else in afterwards but i'm not really a fan of doing that we'll, we'll yeah we'll, we'll put a, a good chunk of it in first and sort of hedge our bets on the weather uh, it used to be very very safe for a late april early may rain but we found the last few years the rainfall is just getting harder and harder to predict. So it's yeah, it's really a matter of trying to trying to get as much in early as we can safely, and yeah, still be being able to pick up if, if that early stuff fails. And that's why we're looking if we can find a break crop that we can sow quite comfortably at the end of May, it'd be great because if you know if it's middle of April, it's still dry, no rain on the horizon, we might pull some canola and look at trying to put something in at the end of the season rather than or the end of the cropping program rather than the start but it's it's a tricky one here we get quite often get a hot hard finish like we're getting again this year yeah um and so the earlier the earlier you sow it the better the better yield you're going to get but then you get that frost window as well so it's really yeah there's a few different things we've got to keep in mind when we when we put sowing times in yeah as a farmer everything all the elements go against you but if you can sliver in that window that just works perfectly and you can pull it off hopefully you can have a bumper harvest so over the past few years what's this year looking like compared to i know you've been through several years of drought but having taken that average in mind this year's looking a fair bit better from those rain events oh, in yeah April. yeah definitely so we if you asked me this two months ago i would have told you we we're on track for a record our best year ever by far um yeah, right. hasn't rained in hasn't rained in three months so it's amazing what the crops are doing, but I think that we got we had such a wet. Well, we had 270 mil started raining in April, and that was up to the end of July. So just extremely wet. Um, the subsoil was chock a block full. The crops built bulk, big biomass, big heavy crops. So they've been drawing on that subsoil moisture and their own moisture for the last couple of months, and it's amazed me how they how they've coped. They're looking really good. Look, the quality is going to be down. It's going to be screenings in the barley. It's going to be feed. The wheat's probably going to be, well, I don't know, the wheat, the protein will be up on the wheat due to the dry finish, but there are probably going to be some screenings there as well. But, yeah, it's, it's yield-wise, I think we're still on track for above average year. It feels funny saying that, but the crops, they look the part. Yeah, so all you can hope for is beating your average, that benchmark that you set on for your crops for the previous year. But for your cropping program, what sort of techniques, as a young person that's farming with the family as well, what techniques or technologies have you implemented that's probably saved you time or money um, within your cropping program? Yeah, definitely. So I think the, the previous generation, the, the massive gains we made were a minimum till. Um, obviously, uptake of a lot of herbicides. Um, I, none of us like using herbicides, but the reality is, it suits our farming system the best at the moment. Um, so minimum till full stubble retention, a lot of that sort of stuff. But a lot of that yep. sort of stuff was done. Uh, and and um, like my old man was one of the first to take up liquid nitrogen in the area as well. We call it Flexian, the CSPP product. Um, it's easy and I think you can call it over there. 
And so a lot of things like that, infrared um, fungicides, but that was all sort of before my time. I was coming in just when that was sort of starting to kick off. We've sort of been pushing more on the technological front, so more on data management. We've got some um, weather stations of our own spread around. We've got our harvester has got telematics set up in it for the first time this year. Yep. Uh, sorry, our boom spray has now harvester will, so we can have um, live data going straight to the cloud from the machines. Um, we've started using some farm management software that we can start running gross margins ourselves and cost of production per hectare and a lot of things like that. So. I think a lot of our innovation over the last 10 years that I've been involved with and, and helped drive is more of that technological and, and, and data sort of area. Out there, we're still, you know, we're, we're always moving forward. There's, there's a lot of heavy trial work done in the area and, and yields are continuing to grow, which is really good. But I think that massive revolution we saw with minimum till and full summer retention, um, I believe the next one we're going to see is, is going to be more data related. Yeah, definitely. Uh, data, is, data is probably the biggest um, word going around agriculture at the moment. What you can do with it. I see a lot of farmers, uh, they're collecting it, but they're not quite sure how to use it. Starting to like use that data on your farm, how do you see it, the best outcome, the success from collecting that data? Yeah, definitely. So we, um, we've actually, I've co-founded a group in Esperance we brand ourselves as the first data grower group in Australia. Great now, to clarify that, we're a, we're a grower group. We're EZI Group Incorporated. Uh, we're a non-for-profit grower group, um, but we only focus on data. So I know a lot of other groups there have data as a focus, but data is our sole focus. We don't focus on anything else, no production. Yep. Technology, obviously, a little bit, because you need technology or you don't need. Technology is easier to help create data. Um, but we are just a sole data group. So we focus on that problem with trying to get, there's farmers that are recording data, obviously, that don't know what to do with it. There's data that's getting recorded itself and there's data that isn't getting recorded. How do we get people to start recording that data? And then what do we do with it once it's been recorded? You know, I've got myself, I've got 10 messy databases. I've got file cabinets full of paper. So we've, um, we've engaged a group in Perth, Access Tech, and I've engaged them personally myself and as well. And they've built a database for me. They've ingested all my paper records, all databases we've accumulated over the years. They're just ingesting and pulling that in. And we're trying to streamline that to a system where with minimal effort, we can start reporting on 20, 30 years of data from all different data streams. There's a lot of work to go yet, but we're really trying to fill that gap at the moment to make that data work for us. That's pretty unreal that you've taken the initiative to do that. What sort of data points are you looking for, like one or two um, off the top of your head that you see yeah. will benefit like the outlook? Yeah, oh, it's, it's huge. And I think, uh, so deep heard over here, uh, uh, I've got their finger in the pie in the universities. Everyone's having a crack at this space. But I think a lot of people are focusing too heavy on, you know, we can get massive amounts of data and smash them together and, and draw all those awesome conclusions. For us, it's really basic and it comes back to that um, crop rotation issue. So people, people, you either you grow canola as a bait crop, and this is in our area, you grow canola as a bait crop, you make money out of it. You grow legumes as a great as a bait crop, you sometimes you don't make money out of it, but you put nitrogen back in the ground. Or do you run livestock and you have a pasture that puts nitrogen in the ground and obviously you harvest your wool and your sheep? There's People have their gut feels, people have their ideas and people have, have done numbers on each of, of them ideas and some people use a, use a mix of all of them. But which one, excuse me, which one is the most profitable over time? So we sort of run an idea, we, we, we do some canola, we do some legumes. Now, over a 10-year period, is it more profitable to buy nitrogen and put in your canola, uh, put canola in and buy nitrogen? Or is it more profitable to grow legumes and have that natural and in the ground? And how does that, go over summer times when it mineralizes and things like that. Now there are answers that we can, there are questions that we can only really answer with long-term data streams and it's simple stuff, rainfall versus nutrients versus yield versus crop rotation. So I think it's, it's them basic data sets. We can get them and run them together over time. Now the data is only, the answer is only as good as the data you put in. So it's got to be clean, good standardized data, which doesn't really exist in the industry at the moment. But anything's better than nothing. Just getting people's yield data, rotation data, nutrients data over as long a period as we can get, we can really start to draw some good answers from that and just prove 
prove that it works. Once we've proved that it works, we can grab any data data streams or data sets we want and start to push them together. So it's, it's all about, I'll get in trouble a bit with a couple of people that I work with because I talk about production and they talk about pro- profitability and I get profitability, but also we focus on production. We want to grow big, big, big flashy crops. You know, we, we get excited about seeing a massive a, a three and a half, four tonne barley crop, which isn't very common in my area. And people go, but is that crop profitable or not? I don't know. It looks good. Well, get some more flexing on it. Make it look better. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we, we need to focus on is that crop profitable or not? But also, I'm still trying to get my head around if we produce less and become more profitable, how do we feed a growing population? So we need to up production while keeping that profitability there. You know, we, we can't drop production and become more profitable. That's just my own personal personal view. But the, the way to answer all them questions and sort of back up our gut feel and gut feel is pretty powerful. You know, my old man's been a farmer for the last 30 years. You know, 99, 99% of the time he is right. His gut feel is right. But it would be good to back that up with some hard facts and some hard data. Yeah, 100% agree with that. Like a lot of agriculture goes off face value. Like what, mm. we, what we're looking at, like if my crop looks like a bloody bumper crop, but I put $1,000 an acre into it, inputs, just to get it to that stage is not going to be very profitable. That's a exag- slight exactly. exaggeration. But if you're going to be doing that and your neighbor, it doesn't look quite as good, but he hasn't put half of what the other neighbor has put on, but and his profit's going to be higher than what that guy's is. So it's what you put into it, what you get out of it. Um, but also backing it by the data is pretty good to see as you move on but also that long-term outlook for that 30 years to see what data points you need to be looking at and what can really help you move your farm onto the next level. But mate, it's great to have an insight into it. We'll just go to the break for a quick second and then we'll come back to it. Welcome back to the podcast, Uh, John. Thanks for coming on again and learning about your enterprise to see how it's all going. So we've heard about your cropping program, what's going on, your season ahead and what harvest should look like this year and the techniques or technologies you've implemented and the data that you're looking to chase down over the long term. What are some of the challenges you've had in the last year trying to get this crop up and running? If that's employment, trying to get people on for harvest casuals, or just trying to navigate around working with the family? What's been the most challenging aspects? Well, I think probably number one is I've got a two and a half year old. So she she has there. her challenges and and we we had a had a baby boy in, in March. So I think this has been the busiest year of my life. I think having um yeah, growing the family has definitely, definitely put the put the pressure in a good way. It wouldn't have it any other way, but it's definitely, definitely made it busy. But no, I think. The challenges this year, we've been very lucky with staff. Uh, like we said before, we haven't used any casuals at seeding time this yep. year. We did it all in-house. And I'm really lucky to have a couple of blokes that really care about our operation. And, and we run it as a family farm. You know, we're all part of the family. So um, we're probably a bit on our own there because I know a lot of the industry is suffering from staff troubles. The, the biggest issue we probably face this year is like every year, it's, it's, the, it's the frost and the drought. So we... Um, Coming out of it, uh, well, we essentially at the start of the season, we came out of drought conditions. You know, we started getting good rainfall. So the challenge then is coming off the two deficit income years, we had to spend a lot of money on chemical herbicides. So we've had weeds that have been laying dormant in the soil for the last few years that we'd normally get two or three summer kills on them. Um, and they've been making it through. This year with a wet summer, we started, you know, we sprayed and we sprayed a lot before seeding time. Yep. So that that was a challenge. And then obviously putting the crops in, you know, we put a lot of pre, pre-emergent herbicides in. We come back to some post-emergent herbicides or post-seeding pre-emergent herbicides. And we spent a lot more money this year than we budgeted before and than we have in the past, just trying to clean up that seed bank that's been sitting there for the last few years. Then obviously we come into seeding and we budgeted for an average crop of two to two and a half tonnes. So we, we bought all the inputs for that. Uh, kept raining, kept raining, season's looking up. So we kept buying more fertiliser, buying more fertiliser, putting more inputs on. So I obviously had to go out in the bank, get some more money to do that. And then the tap turns off. So it was, it's been a been a really tricky season that we've come out of drought conditions. Here we are, we've got the potential. 
and we're, we're a bit hesitant to try and chase that potential just off the bat for the last two years. And then when we finally made the decision to chase that potential, that sort of capped it off. But we we used our farm consultant and our private agronomist and we sat down and we crunched some numbers and we at the time it felt like we were pulling it back a little bit, but it turns out we put the exactly the right amount of nitrogen on for the crops we're going to get. So we've managed it really well, but it's been a real roller coaster of a season. It's, it's just been managing that weather. Um, and that's the same for every season, but this season is specifically coming out of out of that drought and then essentially back into it again with um, 270 mils falling in about three to four months. It's, that's been our biggest challenge, I'd say. But the, the frost, there's been some nasty frosts in the area. We copped a massive one in 2019 that wiped out 80% of the program. Right. We didn't get that this year, yeah. though. People people around or north of us and in the wheat belt did get that this year. So that's always a big threat for us. And we spread our cropping program out. We do we have a yield penalty for putting crops in over a two-month period, just spreading them out so we can mitigate that frost. And it worked for us this year. We mitigated the frost, but we also suffer a yield penalty in doing that. So frost is a challenge for us every year. But, yeah, I'll, I'll just say that that heavy rainfall pattern early on really – really really challenges this year but to qualify that um any challenges involves rainfall is a good one we'll have to take that one on. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely no matter how hard it is but as long as it's not smack down right around where harvest is and it falls over in the end we had that a few years ago yeah. um yeah so hopefully that doesn't happen again i'm from a livestock background and during drought you sort of to mitigate your risk you de-stock from a cropping background, what do you do during drought? You just don't plant the crop. How does it work? We, we always plant a crop. Um, yep. People in the past have done that, not planted a crop, but you can plant a crop and it can start raining in June, July, and you think it's too late and you'll get some pretty good crops still. So we always put a crop in regardless. Um, what we do in a drought is we'll pull inputs. So we'll pull our phosphate and, and we saw sample. We saw sample three points in every single paddock every year. And so we've got a pretty good idea what our um, phosphate fertilizer is doing and our trace elements over time. So we'll pull our, our phosphate rates right back and we'll start mining the phosphate out of the soil. We'll pull our nitrogen right back. Um, repairs and maintenance, we'll go back to bare bones. So, you know, the harvesters, if we're looking to harvest a one and a half tonne crop, the harvester doesn't need 30 grand spending on it. If it's going to harvest a three and a half tonne crop, then we're going to have to pour some money into it. So we'll just, yeah, pull repairs and maintenance back big time and pull our inputs back big time as well. Same with a lot of um a lot of fungicides and insecticides you know if there's a big big healthy looking crop there we'll we'll go into that for the crop um if the crop's not looking that good we'll do the bare minimum we won't go out and put expensive fungicides on it or go and spray a canola when there's a few bugs kicking around because yeah. you know it's not really worth it so that's essentially our form of de-stocking is just yeah being realistic on the yield potential we're going to chase yeah beautiful way to put it um for that de-stocking is really useful but to lower your inputs and how you work that with your with your crops and also a few years later you can get on top of it once you get a bit of cash flow can't you now that you're a little bit set up and looking at a better harvest this year what are the goals that you've had for this year coming into harvest not only for your yield your tonnage that you want to get off but also as a farming family do you set goals that you sort of trying to direct towards too or how does that work for you guys yeah def definitely do we have a monthly business meeting we've been doing it for a year, nearly two years now where it's just me and my, my my wife and my mum and dad all the partners of the business we sit down and, and we have our monthly goals and our long-term goals and we also use farm and co and so we have a, a mid-year review and an end of year review and that's where we they're really good for setting our goals as well our goal has always been expansion. Um, we've been pushing expansion for the last 30 years. Since buying that land at Vali, now our goal is consolidation, debt consolidation. Yeah. So we've got enough land now that we're comfortable. We don't want to take any more on. I've got a young family. I don't want to be spending 80 hours a week at work. I want to be able to enjoy that. So definitely debt consolidation and building our infrastructure now. So a lot of road works, a lot of fencing, a lot of things that have been put off on the back burner because we've yeah. been trying to expand. Now it's just tidying things up. But another another really big one at the moment is safety. So obviously with this industrial mass sort of laws that are coming in, um, our Labor government over here are pushing it pretty hard. And 
it's not necessarily, oh, I shouldn't say it's not necessarily a bad thing. Where I've been in the mining industry and I've seen where that goes, I don't want to see it go that far because it's, it gets counterproductive really quick. Yeah. We can't afford to be counterproductive where we are. But definitely, we do need to be safer on farm. So we've been doing a lot of training. We've got our working at Hyatt's confined spaces. We're doing forklift training. We booked in some training next year on farm, get a, a TAFE employee out for a week. And, and I think, yeah, safety, you know, getting checklists, getting registers, fire extinguishers, first aid kits, all that sort of stuff in line where it should be. Um, that's been a big goal for us. And a lot of my time in the last few months has really been focused on getting the farm up to scratch because we'll probably lag behind a bit historically. Yeah, I think that's a pretty good point. Yeah, I'm looking good. to optimise our family farm. That's like not looking at expanding, but I'd love to expand a little bit more. But I think there's so much value in optimising and getting that infrastructure up to work a little bit better, make your day-to-day routine that much easier. Um, and it can really spruce up the place that you work and call home as well um, and optimising improving how much you can get off on the amount of space would be pretty cool to do it without spending these whopping prices on how much land's going for at the moment. It's pretty expensive to be buying more land. Yeah, Yeah, no, it's definitely, it's it's ridiculous. And and we're the same. Quality of life's got to come into it too. You know, like obviously we want to be able to have enough scale that we can, we can comfortably do what we do, but, I don't know, I see some of the big farms and I take my hat off to them how they can do it, but that's monstrous. I, I don't think I've got what it takes to run something like that. Yeah, I don't blame you at all. Running a farm and also having a small family. Also, congratulations on the young one up in March. Good to see the yeah, family cheers. business is growing and you'll have someone to succeed you after, which is really important as well and another episode, no doubt. But yeah, it's great to have those goals of moving in um, and looking at your outlook. Good to see that you're having those monthly meetings with the family to see where you can go and setting those goals. So before we go, what's one piece of farms advice that's probably stuck with you that your parents have instilled in you or someone in the industry or even outside the industry from the mines? Yeah, definitely. I think it's, oh man, instilled this into me pretty heavily from the start. Yeah. If you don't want to do it, don't do it. Um, there's no one's forcing you to do it. Um, he was always really open. There was no pressure on me to come home. Uh, he's a diesel mechanic and a farmer. So like probably most young blokes out there, old enough and become a diesel mechanic and a farmer. <laughs> me, and me, old get on, me and my old man get on really well, work together really well. But don't, don't feel pressured to do it. Um, you only get one crack at life. I'm living my dream. I couldn't be happier doing what I'm doing. But if you're not happy doing it or if the stress is getting to you or things are getting hard, talk to someone or, or do something that makes you happy, you know. Like it's, you've you've really got to really got to enjoy what you do. And it's a bit of a, bit of a sorry, probably a soppy cliche, but if you do what you do, it's not work, is it? So if, you, if you enjoy what you do, it's not work. Yeah, absolutely. I haven't worked a day in my life. Being back on the farm, it's pretty good to be back home working on the family farm as well. So, thanks for coming on the show, mate. A few questions to wrap it up for the harvest series who else would you like to hear on the farms Vice podcast and why we'll keep it harvest related harvest related i, I like your idea of getting some um some like we said before we started some machinery some machinery people involved especially with the way machinery prices are going at the moment um and i do apologize i haven't listened to it before but have you have you i don't know have you spoken to anyone involved in government or or anything like that because it seems to be as a in farming, you know, we're, we're only 20% of the population, we're a minority, and in our democratic system, it's pretty hard for us to have a say. And it'd be interesting to see what what both sides of government, not to get political, but just how they view us and, and what they feel about farming. Yeah, definitely. I think it's pretty relevant in this day and age. They need to sort of connect with the farmers that are supporting them and driving their ambitions, ambitions for farming and the outlook that you have you've instilled by the family. Um, So I think that'd be a pretty good recommendation as well. So I'll have to track a few down. I had Adam Marshall from over here on the East Coast. He was recommended um, just last week. So we'll get into that and hopefully we can get a few on. Mate, thanks for coming on the show. How can we get in touch? Are you on social media to follow along your farming journey? Yeah, definitely. So we haven't got a huge social media presence, but probably the best place is um, Sanders for Farms at Twitter. Um, I don't even know what my handle is. That's how. 
It'd be all good. I'll I'll have it in the no. show notes anyway. So yeah, we'll that, be able to that's find how that. we got in. That's how we got in touch. I come across you and yeah, followed you on Twitter. So yeah, Sanderson Farms on Twitter. Look, send us a personal message. Um, I'm on Facebook personally with John Sanderson. Um, Sanderson Farms has got a Facebook page. We don't use that very much. But um, yeah, jump on there and I'll put a, put a tweet up every now and then just to keep up with what we're doing. Beautiful. You have to tweet after harvest to tell us how it all went. But John Sanderson, the data farmer, thank you very much for coming on to the Farms Wise podcast. Um, and I'll be sure to keep in touch further down the line. Ah, awesome, Jack. Thanks a lot. And look, take my hat off to you. Congratulations on well on doing this. I listen to a fair few podcasts that aren't farm related and people just like yourself that are getting out there and representing their industry or their interest and, and having a mad crack at it. So look, I'll definitely jump on and, and start listening to it over harvest. Plenty of hours in the header and I'll get the people around me onto it too, mate. Yeah, really appreciate you reaching out and great to have a chat. Beautiful, mate. Straight back at you.